Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the serotonin or 5-hydroxytryptamine receptors. Okay, so we've now discussed the five different families of G-protein coupled receptors, and we've seen that uh, our serotonin receptors, those which are G-protein coupled receptors, are all rhodopsin family G-protein coupled receptors, which means that the serotonin molecule is going to bind to the serotonin receptor within the transmembrane domains, basically. So they all look like so. Okay, here are the seven characteristic membrane spanning alpha helices. They then have a very small amino terminal domain and a small carboxylic acid tail. And then the ligand binds in the transmembrane region here, in the extracellular third of the transmembrane regions. Okay, right. Uh, so we now want to discuss the G protein cycle, which is how. Uh, a ligand-bound G-protein coupled receptor is going to actually interact with heterotrimeric G-proteins. Okay, so for this we need to introduce the heterotrimeric G-proteins. Okay, so let's have the cell membrane here, and let's begin our discussion of the heterotrimeric G-proteins. So, heterotrimeric, what does this mean? Hetero means different, okay? Trimeric means free-membered. Okay, and then G protein in full stands for guanine nucleotide binding regulatory protein. Okay, so these are proteins involved in cell signaling which bind to guanine nucleotides. So G is short for guanine nucleotide binding and then regulatory protein. Okay, or just G protein for short. Right. So, heterotrimeric G proteins are going to consist of three subunits, which are all different, okay? And they have an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, and a gamma subunit. Now, I'm going to start off discussing alpha subunits. So, I'll draw my alpha subunit here, okay? So, this is going to represent my alpha subunit. Now, alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins are rather special. They have two states, like all G proteins. Okay, they have an on state in which they have guanosine triphosphate, GTP, bound to them, and then they have an off state in which they have guanosine diphosphate, GDP, bound to them. So let's say that our alpha subunit is going to start off in the off state and therefore will have guanosine diphosphate bound to it. Okay, and let's color it in in red here. So here's my alpha subunit currently in the off state with GDP bound to it. Now, the other thing I need to mention is that they are attached to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there. All I mean by the inner leaflet is the inner layer of phospholipids that makes up the phospholipid by there, sometimes called the inner leaflet. Okay, and they are attached to this via a lipid moiety that sticks off the side of them, basically. Okay, so they have a very long hydrophobic lipid moiety sticking off the side of them. So let me explain this in a little bit more detail. So basically, they can either have a palmitic acid molecule or a meristic acid molecule sticking off the side of them, and some of them even have both. So let me explain this. So, we'll start with palmitic acid. Okay, so palmitic acid is the old biochemist name for a molecule that would now be called hexadecanoic acid. Okay, whoops, I can rescue it though. Hexadecanoic acid. And although hexadecanoic acid is a bit more of a mouthful compared to palmitic acid, it's a useful name because it tells us exactly what it is. Okay, it tells us that we're dealing with a uh, 16 carbon fully saturated carboxylic acid. So here is the carboxylic acid group. Okay, we then need 15 more carbons attached to the here. So we're going to have 14 methylene groups and then a methyl group on the end. Now, I don't have space or the willpower to draw 14 methylene groups. So instead, what I'm going to do is draw one methylene group like so and then bracket it like this and subscript that 14. That's a useful trick for getting out of having to write 14 methylene groups. And what it means is repeat this thing 14 times. And then right on the end, we have a methyl group, like so. So here is the methyl group. So this is the structure of 
carminic acid or hexadecanoic acid. And what you can do is you can link these molecules onto uh, well, onto cysteine residues within the um, alpha subunit of the heterodimeric G protein, basically. And then what will happen is the really long hydrophobic tail will be dangling off the molecule, basically. And uh, this can then implant into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there, and it will be very stable, and it will hold uh, or tether the alpha subunit to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there. Another one that can be added in some cases is myristic acid. And this one's more rare, but uh, some of the alpha subunits do get myristic acid added on. Myristic acid is the old name for a uh, molecule that would now be called tetradecanoic acid. And it's the 14 carbon fully saturated carboxylic acid. Okay, so instead of having 14 methylene groups, it will only have 12 to give it a total number of carbons of 14. Okay, the message, however, is that you have this long hydrophobic structure dangling off the side of you, which can implant into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there and hold you at the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there. Okay, now some of them even actually have two of these, but that's very rare. Okay, so... Um, here is my alpha subunit, currently in the off state and being held uh, at the um, phospholipid by there, basically. Okay, so we now need to discuss the other two subunits. Now, whilst the alpha subunit is in the off state and has guanosine diphosphate bound to it, it can associate with the other two subunits. However, when it's in the on state, it won't associate with these two. But these other two always remain with each other. So let me now discuss these other two. And we'll draw them next to the alpha subunit because currently our alpha subunit is in the off state. Okay, so these two always, 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 under every situation, remain together. So you have a beta subunit and then also a gamma subunit. So we'll colour in the beta subunit in blue here. Okay, and then we'll have the gamma subunit in green. Okay, right. And because these two always stay together, they're often referred to as the beta-gamma complex, or some people will just call it the beta-gamma subunit, referring to both of them bound together, basically. Now, the gamma subunit also has a really long hydrophobic structure that's been added onto it, that is non-proteinergic, that's been stuck on, basically, that is holding it anchored at the inner leaf that the phospholipid by there. This isn't quite as simple as the palmitoyl or myristoyl groups that the alpha subunit has put on. Instead, it's what's known as a prenal group. Okay, uh, but all that's important is that you understand that it's got a very long hydrophobic structure sticking off the side of it that's a lipid structure and which is implanting into the inner leaf that of the phospholipid by there and therefore holds the beta gamma complex at the underside of the cell membrane basically. Okay, right. So, when the alpha subunit is in the off state, it will associate with a beta-gamma complex, and they will then form the full heterotrimeric G protein, which is just wandering around in the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there, or rather attached to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there, or under the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there. Okay, right. Then what's going to happen is... Um, the ligand is going to come in and bind to our uh, G protein coupled receptor. And what's then going to happen is our G protein coupled receptor is going to interact with the heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, now there are many different types of heterotrimeric G proteins that I haven't discussed yet, but we will come on to this. Okay, I will discuss the many different types of alpha subunits, the many different types of beta. In fact, actually, I think we'll discuss the many different types of alpha, beta, and gamma subunits now, and then we'll come to the G protein cycle after we've done that. Okay, I think it would make more sense. So let's discuss the many different types of alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. So we'll start off with the alpha subunit, which is the most difficult one. Okay, so the really simple thing would be if there was only one alpha subunit, and this was the alpha subunit of heterotrimeric G proteins, and that was that. But instead, there are 
16 different genes for alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. Okay, and even worse than that, they actually produce 21 different subunits. Okay, that are known. Okay, and that number will probably change over the years as more are discovered. Okay, uh, so this seems like a bit of an anomaly at first. 16 genes, 21 subunits, what's happened there? Okay, but I will remind you of the phenomenon of different splice variants. Okay, so let's talk about the central dogma of biology. So, let's say we have here uh, a gene of one of these alpha subunits, okay? So this is the gene of one of the alpha subunits. These two lines represent the two strands of the DNA, okay? I haven't drawn them coiled up, which is probably why you might be struggling to recognize what this is. So this is some alpha subunit gene, okay? So I'll highlight this box in a color so you, that you'd realize that I'm just sort of highlighting the gene. Okay, right. So one of these strands of DNA, and I'm not gonna color it in that color, um, one of these strands of DNA, which I'm colouring in green now, will be what's known as the coding strand of the DNA. Okay, so let's say that in green, this is the coding strand of the DNA. Whilst the other strand of DNA, which I'll colour in in blue, this will be the non-coding strand. Now, what does that mean? Well, when RNA polymerase II works its way along this piece of DNA and produces a piece of mRNA, it will only actually use one of the strands to actually make the complementary piece of mRNA. It does not require both of the strands. Now, the one that it uses to make the piece of mRNA that's complementary to that strand is called the coding strand. So this is the piece of DNA that RNA polymerase II is actually going to use in its transcription process. Okay, so it will work its way along the coding strand of the DNA and it will synthesize a piece of mRNA that is complementary. Okay, so I'll color this in in red, I think. So here is the piece of mRNA that's complementary to that coding strand. This piece of mRNA is now going to be spliced, okay? So it does not go straight to being translated. Instead, it's known as the primary transcript or the pre-mRNA. And it needs to be further processed before it can actually go through a ribosome and be translated into protein. Okay, now the reason that it needs to be further processed is that actually some of the portions of this pre-mRNA are not supposed to be translated. Okay, some of them are, and I'll highlight these now in boxes. So let's say this portion is supposed to be translated. This portion here is also supposed to be translated. And this portion is supposed to be translated. The portions that are actually supposed to be translated by the ribosome and make a protein, these are called the exons. Okay? And the portions that are in between these exons, so this portion here, this portion here, this portion here, these are known as the introns. Okay, so what you now need to do is you need to take your piece of pre-mRNA and you need to cut out the introns and sew the exons back together to get a smaller piece of mRNA, okay, shown here, which is called the mature mRNA. Okay, so this is the mature mRNA, and this mature mRNA can then go through uh, the translation process, so it can go through a ribosome and be turned into a protein. Now, basically, there is, well, firstly, this process where you cut out the introns and then sew the exons back together, this is known as splicing. Okay, now, in some cases, there are alternative ways that the uh, pre-mRNA can be spliced. So let me give you an example. Okay, so for instance, in some mRNAs, uh, there are exons which are optional, basically. Either you can include them, in which case you'll get a slightly longer piece of mRNA, or you don't have to include them. Okay, so that means that there are two different pieces of mature mRNA that you could then overall create. One which had this exon in and one which didn't. And they would go for slightly different proteins. Okay, so you can produce two different pieces of mature mRNA from the same piece of pre-mRNA, which therefore lead to two different overall proteins. And these two different proteins that you can produce from the same gene are then called the different splice variants of that gene.
Okay, right. So this is how one gene can actually lead to the production of a greater number of proteins, basically. Okay, and that's the phenomenon of splice variants. So that's how we've got 16 genes and then 21 subunits. Some of them will have multiple splice variants. And, you know, there are other examples of how you can end up with different pieces of mature mRNA from the same piece of pre-mRNA. Some pre-mRNAs can have a huge number of different mature mRNAs and therefore a huge number of different splice variants. That was just a very easy to understand example of how you can generate different splice variants. Okay, so we'll continue this discussion in the next video where we'll discuss the 16 different genes of the alpha subunits. We won't quite go in for all the splice variants. Then we'll discuss the different beta and gamma subunits as well.